So Christmas is a little bit difficult for me sometimes because it happens every year, and that's good, and I love it. Um, but to come up with new things to say at Christmas, like how do you, how do, you do that? Like how do, you, how do you find something new to say about a story that people have heard all of their lives? And so I'm not really even going to try to come up with anything new. Uh, C.S. Lewis said, the best teachers don't actually teach us things we don't know. They just remind us of things we do know, maybe in a different way. And for, for the next few weeks, we'll be looking at the Christmas story in Matthew and Luke. But today, I wanted to start in the Gospel of John. And if you are familiar with the Gospel of John, you will say, well, there's no Christmas story in the Gospel of John. That is correct. There's no Christmas story in John or in Mark. It's only in Luke and in Matthew that we have the Christmas story. But John, when he wrote his Gospel, he was writing to the Jewish people. He wanted the Jewish people to understand how Jesus changed everything. And here's what I mean by Jesus changed everything. If you were raised as a Jewish person, you would wake up and you would go to the synagogue and you would listen and you would learn and you would hear. Or if you lived closer to the temple, maybe you would go to the temple. And then three times a year, wherever you lived, you would go to the temple. You would travel from all over Israel and you would bring your animals for the sacrifices that you were going to, to offer. And you would go through all of the all of the pageantry of the high priest and his robes and the, and the performance, it's, it would be, I call it a performance, it isn't a performance, but it's, it was this, this detailed day on the Day of Atonement of what they would go through. And you would watch this, and maybe if you were little, you would say to your dad, hey dad, what is he doing now? Why is he doing this? If you've ever, ever gone to a, a service in a Catholic church, there's a, a lot of things that happen, and if you're not Catholic, you're kind of like, what is he doing? What does this mean? Why is he? And then Jesus comes on the scene, and after his death and resurrection, all of that is done away with. There's no more sacrifices. There's no more going to the temple. There's no more new moon festivals or no more. All of that is set aside. It would be similar to if you, living in America, you've known your whole life, there's a president, there's a Congress, there's a Senate, there's a Supreme Court, there are government officials, I mean state officials, there's a governor, there's local city boards, there's all of these areas of government. And then... Some guy came along, and everything was just now him. We'll say it's Dave, because, you know, Dave is over there. Dave comes along, and everything is Dave. And you say, well, what about the Supreme Court? No more Supreme Court. It's Dave. What about the president? No more president. It's Dave. What about the Senate? No more Senate. It's Dave. What about Congress? No more Congress. It's Dave. Well, what about the governors of all the states? Dave. That's what Jesus did. All of their old system was now set aside. There were no more sacrifices. There was no more Day of Atonement. There was no more Festival of Booths. It was all Jesus. In fact, the Passover meal, the thing that was so big, because they celebrated the Passover every year, Jesus redefined the Passover at the Last Supper. He took the bread that for years and years and years had represented the fact that they left Egypt in a hurry and they didn't have time to let the bread rise. That's why it was unleavened bread. Jesus said, yeah, I know. Since the time of Moses, this bread has represented that we left Egypt in haste. Well, now it represents my body broken for you. And the cups of wine, they would have four different cups at the Passover, each of them representing different things. He says, now this cup is my blood poured out for the forgiveness of sins. He redefined everything. It was all now Jesus. And that's why in the book of Acts, obviously the Jews have a hard time accepting this. It's like, no, it can't be all Jesus. What about the Sabbath? What about the New Moon Festival? 
What about, what about the food laws? You're not going to tell me it's okay to eat pork rinds now, are you? And it was all Jesus. And so when John writes the Gospel of John, he begins before time. And he says these words. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, we don't know who the Word is yet. We find out in verse 14. I'm going to tell you right now, so you don't have to wait till verse 14. The Word is Jesus. Jesus is also known as the Word in the Gospel of John. But here, John begins his letter, and he says, in the beginning was the Word. And if you are familiar with Genesis 1, and if you were Jewish, you certainly would have been familiar with Genesis 1. As soon as you hear the words, in the beginning, you're automatically going to say, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And now John, everything is Jesus. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God and the word was God. And that's kind of like, what? Like, how can, how can the word be with God and be God? Because he's with God. How can, he be, how can he be God and be with God? And John, again, is writing to his audience to let them know everything is Jesus now. Everything is Jesus. And he reveals through this book that Jesus himself is God. Not God alone, because there's the triune God. There's still the Father and the Son and the Spirit, which again was a new concept, because in the Old Testament, they understood that God was one, and maybe there's, because it says, let us make man in our image, but it's not, it's nowhere specifically clear that God is three and he's one, and now John has to reveal this to them, and he's writing about the one that he saw. He says in his first letter, I'm writing to you about what we saw, what our hands touched, the guy that we walked with and talked with and hung out with, the one that we know. That's who we're writing about. So here he is, and he says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. So he's always been. Before there were the heavens and the earth. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And you know what? That's, that's tough. Like, I'm sure most of you at some point in your life have thought this thought, where did God come from? Like, how could he always be? Like, who made him? And here's the answer. Nobody made him. He always existed. And you say, well, that doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. It's difficult, but it's the truth. And, and sometimes people want a long answer. They want like a great detailed explanation. There are some things that there is no great detailed explanation for because the answer is the answer. See, if I tell you what is two plus two and you say four, I say, well, give me more. Like, explain. You're like, well, because you take two and you add two more. And when you take those two and those two, then you have four. And I, yeah, but give me more. Help me understand how is it four. And you're like, I, what are you talking about? It's two and two. It's four. Well, it's the way it is with God always existing. He just always existed. He always has been. And I know there are a lot of people who don't like this idea, but they can't, in the end, we can't really get away from it. Even people that don't want to believe in God. Dr. Lawrence Krauss. He's a physicist. He's also an atheist. In fact, in his Wikipedia page, it says that he spends his life trying to, to make sure that we don't need fa fantastic myths like religion. He doesn't want there to be a God. But he has this quote, The apparent logical necessity of a first cause is a real issue for any universe that has a beginning. Do you, I'm just going to say this again. The apparent logical necessity, because when you think about it, something needs a beginning. And he's talking about this world that we live in, of any universe that has a beginning. He says, therefore, on the basis of logic alone, 
one cannot rule out such a deistic view of nature. Because as he studied the stars, as he studied everything, he comes to the conclusion, somehow it got here. And I don't know how it got here. But you can't say that it's impossible that there is some deistic being because we're here and we need a first cause. And people ask the same thing. Well, what is the first cause of God? God is his own cause. I don't know how it happened. But in the beginning, the word was with God and the word was God and he was with God in the beginning. And through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. And this, when you really think about this, this kind of blows your mind too. Well, if you think like I do, it blows your mind. Because I, you know, read Genesis chapter 1, and God said, and God said. And, and when I think of God, I think of like, for some reason, maybe it's because I watched too many, you know, videos as a kid of of God, but he talks like this, let there be light. He's kind of like this big, deep-voiced God. I don't think of Jesus talking like that. I don't imagine Jesus, Peter, go out and catch a fish so we can pay our taxes. I don't imagine Jesus. Jesus was just like, he was a person. He talked like a person. And then you find out, no, everything that was made was made by Jesus, through Jesus, for Jesus. When God said, let there be light, it was Jesus saying, let there be light. When God formed man, it was Jesus forming man. Through him, all things were made. And without him, nothing was made that has been made. And in him, and this, if you really think about this, it, it, it is, wow. In him was life. And that life, was the light of all mankind. All the light. All of the light. And I'm not just talking literal light now. I'm thinking spiritual light, emotional light, every bit of understanding, every bit of knowledge. Without him, there would be no light. See, if it says in him was life and that life was, then you could say, Without his life, there would be nothing but darkness. Without God, there would be nothing but darkness. There'd be no thinking, there'd be no seeing, there'd be no knowing. Without him, all of this, it's, it's like the sun lights our world. And I think when I was a kid, because it's been a long time, that was a pretty hard thought for me to get my mind around. You're telling me all the light we have comes from the sun? Like one sun is able to light a planet? Are you kidding me? There's no way. There's nothing big enough that it could light a planet. Well, the sun does. Well, in the same way that our one sun lights the entire earth, all of the light everywhere comes from the life of God. All of the thoughts that we think come from him. He's the one who sustains us. It says in Hebrews and Colossians that his word holds us together. It says in the book of Job that if he withdrew his breath, all flesh would crumble to dust. People who don't want him to exist exist because of him. They are being held together because of him. They are sustained because of him because he so loves the world. And, and this, is, this is why I'm talking about John 1 today because it's so hard for me to get my mind around how big God is and how little I am and how much he cares because he's, he created everything. He's the light of everything. And go home and Google some pictures from the Hubble telescope. They see so far, and it's unbelievable the things they see. And all they do, the further they see, the more they realize there's more to see that they can't see. 
And creation is so incredible. The most incredible thing to me about creation is that whatever you would pick to study, and I don't care what it was. If you want to study stars, study stars. If you want to study the moon, study the moon. If you want to study dust mites, if you want to study a rose, if you want to study a banana, if you want to study a dandelion, the more you study, the more amazed you will be because it is so complicated and complex. And when you get down to the atomic level, you find out it's all made of basically little solar systems. That's what an atom looks like. You got protons and neutrons and things floating around and there's all this space and they're all, and then they're held together by shit. It's just, and you're like, how, how is that made? In fact, Neil deGrasse Tyson says that if it were not for the fact that we see stars, we would never believe they exist because forming a star is impossible. And that's this universe that God made. He's that big. And he holds the whole thing together. In him was the life. And that life was the light of all mankind. Every bit of understanding you have comes from him. And we don't really have a lot, but what we do have comes from him. And then he goes on, he said, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it because it can't. The darkness can't overcome the light. As much as Satan wants you to not know there is light, as much as there are people who want there to not be a creator, they still have to say things like this. The problem of first cause in any universe that has a beginning is something that we have to deal with. And with logic alone, logic alone, what do you have beyond logic? If something isn't reasonable, you see, logic is where we get this idea of reason, right? If something isn't reasonable, why would you believe it? And Dr. Krauss says, by logic alone, one cannot say there isn't something somewhere that made this. You can't decide that by logic alone. He says, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And then he shifts gears a little bit, and he starts talking about John the Baptist. He says, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light so that through him all might believe. And, and here's why I think we should be more impressed with Jesus today than they were 2,000 years ago. And he was impressive 2,000 years ago because we know so much more. I mean, we know more about creation we have studied, we understand, we know things like DNA, genetic codes that are in your body that are created by proteins that tell your body to make little machines that do jobs to fix and heal you. Like you cut your, you cut your finger, and I've never once worried that when I cut my finger, like an ear was going to grow there. Because my body knows, because of my DNA and these codes, and it all happens. I mean, have you, ever, have you ever thought to yourself, oh, I have to remember to breathe? See, I forget a lot of things. I forgot to have them light the Advent candle. I don't have to forget to breathe. Do you know why? Because my body just does it. Because we are incredible created beings. And John was sent to let the world know, at least the little Jewish world that Jesus was coming to, that the Messiah was coming. He came to testify concerning that light so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. It was his job to let them know, hey, someone's coming. Someone's coming, and I'm not worthy to carry his shoes. I baptize with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And they came and they asked him, who are you? Who are you? Are you the Messiah? No, I'm not the Messiah. Are you the prophet? No, I'm not the prophet. Who are you? I am a voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight paths for the Lord to travel. 
He was the one sent to let them know the Messiah was coming. And my wife asked me a very interesting question yesterday because, you know, I understand why people today don't like Jesus. I mean, I do. It, and here, here's the reason. In fact, G, John tells us this in chapter 3 of the gospel. Jesus tells us in John chapter 3. He says, here's the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men loved darkness more than light because their deeds were evil. Because we like to do things we ought not to do. And we don't want the light shining on us because we don't want people to know. We don't want to be exposed. Here is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men love the darkness more than light because their deeds were evil. But my wife asked me, but why didn't the Jews want Jesus to be the Messiah? Because they've been waiting for a Messiah. They've been waiting. I, I'm like, that's... What, what secret evils? I mean, other than, I don't, I don't know. I can't tell you why the Jewish people, they should have been the happiest people on earth that the Messiah had come because they've been waiting for the Messiah. They've been longing for the Messiah. And then when John says he's coming, they're all angry and mad. And when Jesus shows up and performs miracles and signs and wonders, they're so mad that eventually they come to a point where they say, we have to kill him. Why? And it's something dark in the human heart. We get twisted. Jeremiah says, the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. And I don't know, I don't know why. I don't know what it is in us that is bent in that direction. But Jesus came because he knew what the world was like. He knew what the human heart was like. And he loved the human heart. He loves us. He loves us. He knows more about you than you know about you. See, sometimes we do things that surprise ourselves. Have you ever said, why did I do that? In like the I'm disgusted with myself way. Jesus is never surprised. He's, he's never surprised by the depths that you sink to because he knows you. He knows the human heart and he so loves the world. He was with God in the beginning. He created the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything that is in them. He knows everything about all and how it works. And he came just as a man. That's why the Christmas story is so amazing. He came just as a baby, and it was a quiet night. There was nothing. In fact, there was no room for him even to stay. And there was nothing going on except in a field nearby where an angel choir showed up. And they came to shepherds, to humble lowly, working men, working the night shift. He came, and here it says in verse 9, the true light that gives life, the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and this is so sad, he was in the world, and though the world was made through him, not just by him, it was made through him. The world did not recognize him. Can you imagine the, the world not recognizing their own creator? I mean, there should have been lines and lines and lines of people just waiting to see him. I was at the Mall of America one day, and I saw these people, and they were lined up, and I walked, and this line was so, so, so long. I thought maybe they opened the new Wahlburgers or something. And then I'm like, what is this line about? And they said that there was some YouTube girl that was in, like, one of the stores. And I'm like, are you serious? This many people lined up to see a, a YouTube girl that I've never even heard of? There was no line like that for Jesus. There was nothing. 
In fact, it says, he came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. The Jewish people didn't even accept him. The ones who've been longing for a Messiah, who've been waiting and hoping for a Messiah, they're like, yeah, no, that's not the Messiah we want. And then there are these beautiful words. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. I want to read that again. Yet to all who did receive him. Remember, the world didn't recognize him and his own rejected him. But John tells us this, but if you receive him, if you hear these words and you decide to accept him, to as many as did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Yeah, it becomes our right. If you receive and if you believe, then they can't take away your right to be a child of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of a human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. Because all those first three, that's our, that's our earth life. That's our born of the flesh. But then we get to be born again. We get to have our second life. We get to be born of God. Children of God. And then in verse 14, he says, the word became flesh and he made his dwelling among us the one that was in the beginning that made everything. He became one of us. He became flesh with our fleshly limitations. It says, we have seen his glory. And in the Gospel of John, glory is a theme. We're not gonna talk much about it today because we're just looking at the first 14 verses. But it's this theme of the glory being revealed. Jesus was the glory of God revealed. Jesus' miracles were the glory of God being revealed. Jesus' death was the glory of God. Jesus' resurrection was the glory of God. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father full of grace and truth. And that last line, full of grace and truth, it's easy to kind of skip over that. You read along and you just kind of skip over it. Think about what he just said, full of grace and full of truth. It's the perfect balance. You see, some of us, we're, we're heavy on truth. There are people that are really heavy on truth. They go around and say, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong, you did that wrong. What's wrong with you? You have a problem. What's this? Truth, 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 truth. And not that truth is bad, because we need to know the truth. But when all we get is the truth, we end up just getting slashed and cut to pieces. And then there are people who are all grace. There's no truth with them. It's like, you know what? It doesn't matter what you want to do. As long we love you just the way you are, be you. Be, it's okay. Everything is wonderful. Love, love, love. And really, that's not love at all. Because if we don't share the truth with people, if we don't tell people, then we're setting them up for the harsh reality of when they finally do meet the truth. But Jesus came in the fullness of grace and the fullness of truth. One of the best examples of this is the woman caught in adultery. Because when they brought her in, Jesus didn't sit there and say, well, I know what you've been doing. I know where, I know you, don't you even, no, shh, 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 shh. I don't want to hear it because I know and I'm disgusted with you. He didn't say anything like that. In fact, he didn't say anything at all. They brought her in and he stooped down and he started writing on the ground and we're not even told what he wrote. The two ideas that seem to make the most sense to me are maybe he started writing the commandments. And everyone was like, oh yeah, no, I did that, I did that. Or maybe he just started writing a list of sins, or maybe specific sins. And it says that the crowds left, starting with the oldest, all the way down to the youngest. And it was just Jesus and the woman. 
And Jesus said to her, where are those who condemn you? Have they all gone? And then Jesus said, because he came in the fullness of grace, neither do I condemn you. Neither do I condemn you. But he also came in the fullness of truth. And he said, go and leave your life of sin. He told her the truth, but he was full of grace. And that's what Christmas is really about. It's about this, this immortal, invisible, almighty being that we can't possibly, possibly measure. The one who always was, who has no beginning and has no end, who's infinite in every way we can imagine being infinite, and yet he became one of us. And he came, and no one recognized him. And no one understood but it didn't stop him from his mission. It says he came to seek and to save that which was lost. It says that he came to destroy the works of the evil one. And he's here with us this morning. He's here now. And he comes to us and he knocks and he calls and he waits and he's full of grace and he doesn't condemn but he's full of truth, and he points us in the right direction. He tells us where we ought to go, and if we will receive him, if we will believe on his name, he gives us the right to be children of God. And this morning, we're going to participate in the body and the blood that was broken and the blood that was poured out for us. The worship team will come and play. The servers will serve. And we'll pass out the bread if you would hold it. And then we'll all partake together. And we'll do the same with the cup. Let's pray. Uh, Father, we just say thank you. And it seems like a small thing. But what else can we say? You are almighty. You are, you are so much more than we can comprehend. And yet you love us. And so, Jesus, we just say thank you. Thank you for coming into the world that night so long ago. In your beautiful name, Jesus, we pray. Amen.